one. After all, they are the stars. In the land of Hollywood, the most loved stars have always been animals. Surefire guarantees to bring home the bacon. I think trainers are the unsung heroes of Hollywood and animal action. And take a bow. All right, girl. The idea that animals are sentient creatures worth something in themselves is quite a jump, and films can at their best help us to make that jump. <laughs> Babe, the champion of animal films, tells the tale of a lovable pig with an unusual dream. Nominated for seven Oscars and winner of a Globe Award, he's trotted back to our screens in a sequel. Lelick. Let go! Let go, Lelick! moment and I remember when I was flying to London and it was the middle of the night and I woke up suddenly uh, by some impulse I put on the audio and listened to someone I have no idea who it was but it was someone reviewing children's books for British Airways back in 85 and as she was reviewing the sheep pig that Dick King Smith had written she sort of giggled or laughed in a way that sort of took her out of what she was meant to be doing and it was that laugh that triggered Babe. <laughs> the sheep pig evolved actually out of the little summer fete that we have in, our, in the village where I live. I was actually in charge of the guests the way to the pig stall and I thought at the time wouldn't it be nice to devise some other life for this little creature than merely to be waiting for the deep freeze. The pig and the farmer regarded each other, and for a fleeting moment, something passed between them, a faint sense of some common destiny. And so gradually the idea evolved of this pig being won by a farmer who has a sheepdog who adopts the piglet teaches him the tricks of her trade, but he's able to teach her something that she and other sheepdogs, or wolves as the pigs call them, never knew, which is that rough, rude behavior gets you nowhere. Politeness gets you everywhere. Beautifully done. I can't tell you how grateful I am to y'all. For Babe, we used 48 pigs. And what we did was six pigs a day would go to work and play the part of big. But within three weeks time, they would outgrow their part. So another six pigs had to come in and continue the next three weeks of shoot. So we had the A set, the B set, the C set, the D set, and each pig was named with an A name, a B name, C name. We take them at age four weeks, just about the time mama would kick them out of the pen anyway. And we hand feed them, bottle feed them for two weeks. We bond with them. We give them a craven to be with us. Pigs, you know, uh, particularly some individual pigs, love being cuddled. And most of them grow up in hard, on hard concrete surfaces, often in the dark, you know, and have no experience of that. Come on, pig. Come on. Oh, come on. 
Easy, boy. Come on. So now, after two weeks of bonding with them, when we walk in the door, they want to be with us. They want our attention. Now we start training them, and we teach them that every time they get food, they hear a click. We reverse this now. We teach them that click means food. Once they learn that we'll present, say, a little brick on the floor, out of boredom, they'll look at the brick. We'll click and give them a piece of food. After a few moments, they'll maybe even take a step close to it. Click and food. So now we put the brick just below frame. The pig comes in, puts his feet up on the brick. You don't notice that he's doing a step up. And if he has to look camera left, that's where we are, a little higher, a little lower with the click. Thus, he never <coughs> rooting for food and nose down to the ground and all that. The pig is always looking up to us for that food reward. Now, pig, I forbid you to talk to or consort with that duck. Ever. Have I made myself clear? Uh, what's consort? It means, young man, that you must not go anywhere near that duck. Two of the most popular talking animals were um, Francis the talking mule and then later Mr. Ed the talking horse. I'm Mr. Ed. <laughs> Wilbur? It's for you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Ed was wired yeah. for talking. Uh, on the off side of the camera, the side away from the camera, they would attach wires to the horse's mouth. And then the trainer would be behind the horse, and he would jiggle those wires, and it would appear as if Mr. Ed was actually talking. Compulsion. Besides, I didn't expect to get caught. <laughs> This has got to be the saddest day of my life. I called you here today. Techniques for making animals talk have come a long way. This prototype computer image is being developed for a new TV series. The difficulty is, is trying to actually make a pig look and talk realistically. We're used to seeing talking on our type of mouth geometry, whereas a pig has got a much longer jaw. And so what tends to happen is you tend to get the the ease, the sort of things that happen at the lip corners appearing sort of way up in, in the head and the ooze and things we usually have happening in the center of the lips happening all the way at the other end of the jaw and so that's a real difficulty. So in addition to the mouth we have a number of other layers, for example the ears where we have control over both ears to give us some sense of expression and then very importantly for a creature is the eye layer. Um, a lot of a character's expression while it's talking comes from the eyelids, so that's very important that we get a large amount of movement. Nowadays, animation is cleverly integrated with live action to create the illusion that animals are talking. Seem like a nice young pig. What be your name? Babe. Not like them wolves. Treat you like dirt they do. Bite you as soon as look at you, the savages. Bite you? And worse. Some wolves be so bad, they run a sheep down and tear it to pieces. <laughs> Fly would never do that. Fly, is it? Hmm. Well, a right vicious creature, she be, I tell you. Not fly. All them wolves is cruel to sheep. Always have been brutal savages, that's what they be. Oh, I wouldn't want to see a gentle soul like you mixing with the likes of them, young. <laughs> At the beginning of the century, Thomas Edison never questioned the morality of electrocuting this elephant on film. He wanted to advertise the power of electricity. The full sequence is too upsetting to be shown today. The idea that animals don't have any soul led some philosophers, notably Vane Descartes, to the view that, well, if they don't have a rational soul, they can't therefore have self-consciousness. And if they can't have self-consciousness, it follows that they can't really experience pain and suffering like other human beings. In 1918, the first Tarzan movie was filmed, Tarzan of the Apes, with Elmo Lincoln. He had to pull the lion out of the cabin by its tail, and the lion turned on him, and he killed it with a knife. But Elmo 
was so surprised you can see in the footage his eyes his face just lights up with disbelief that he's actually accomplished this and then he recovers his composure and puts his foot on the lion and gives the traditional uh, if silent ape call probably the uh, the worst example of cruelty was the use of horses in Western movies there was the uh, charge of the light brigade with Errol Flynn and uh, many of the horses uh, during the action sequences were um, victims of a device called the running W where the horses were tripped and uh, some of them when they were tripped uh, broke their necks. Errol Flynn was outraged by what he saw and uh, he brought it to the attention really of uh, the American public and uh, eventually this practice was stopped. American Humane Association got involved in the oversight of m animals in the movies after a horse was killed in the filming of Jesse James in 1939. Get out! Horse was injured so badly it died. Today, we have uh, the authority to be on every film and television set in America that has an animal in it. Here on Venice Beach in Southern California, an episode of Pacific Blue is being carefully observed. We'll reset. He'll be off the horse on the ground. The horse can be right We can there. ease the public's, you know, a fear that, that something dramatic and horrible is happening to the animal on the screen when, in fact, it was done in cuts and every safety precaution was taken to make sure that the animal action was done safely. The films have had a great deal to do with sort of building our attitude over the years regarding training of horses. And cut. That was good. That was good? Really good. Yeah, it looked great. If you go back to the early westerns, uh, you always had a cowboy that was in a corral and uh, you had a wild horse that needed to be broken and eventually uh, the rider would ride him down and the man triumphed over the wild animal. But we've sort of changed our attitudes as the years have passed regarding this method of training and today well, we have uh, the horse whisperer, for example. I don't know that I can do anything, but I'm prepared to give it a go, if you'll help. And now we're getting into the psychology of the horse and trying to, uh, to meet the horse at least halfway and understand what he's feeling and what he's thinking. Um, there's a cowboy here. To whisper is a very subtle, discreet way of communicating. That's how the finite human mind can process. I'm no better than the horse, and I approach him at that level. It's not going to hurt him, right? Nothing we've done has hurt him. It was simply a way to be with horses that sent a message of understanding and compassion. You're saying you can be what you have to be, and let's understand who we each are and respect our places with one another. There are a growing number of horse whisperers in the West, but on this film set, Rex Peterson is a firm believer in the old-fashioned methods. When I say cut, you stop more being Action. Cut! Quiet, please! Quiet! Believe it or not, Rex was also the trainer of High Tower, star of the Horse Whisperer. Perhaps because his training did not involve whispering, there were accusations of cruelty in the shooting of this scene. on that motion picture every day as the head wrangler for 11 months. 
the horse never did crash a knee to the ground, and if you watch the film, he didn't crash a knee to the ground. He actually went down very slowly. And we put what we call a lay down on a horse, where he's cued to lay down. We didn't pull the horse over or do anything else with a rope. All we did was tap him with a finger, went down, laid over right on the mark, and it doesn't bother him, it doesn't stress him. And Hightower happens to be one of the main horse stars on this episode of Pacific Blue. Um, if we put wires on, or we abused, or we tripped, or we did these various things that stated in there, I don't know how he would have ever survived it. Filming of the Horse Whisperer was overseen by the American Humane Association and given this disclaimer. That end credit disclaimer is a seal of approval that says that not only were no animals really harmed on this film, but that the filmmakers met a much higher standard of care than not just not committing cruelty. I guess play game. <laughs> First dog to lie down. Oh dear, you lost. <laughs> The main thing about animal training is trying to look at the animal's point of view. Um, we're trying to train it in ways that it enjoys, so we're not just teaching it what to do, we're teaching it to want to do what we want it to do, which is a very big difference from the way it used to be when we would force animals to do what we want it to do. One of the worst things that happened to animal training were the, were the two world wars. Um, that uh, the two sides had their various war dogs, if you like, and war horses. And of course, these had to be really good under pressure. So they made the training almost like a military boot camp. And it was very, very brutal and frightening. And the idea was that if the animal made it through training, then it wouldn't fall apart in the trenches. And then, of course, after the Second World War, a lot of people were demobbed and they hadn't got a job, they didn't have an education, so they got into dog training. And a lot of them got into dog training in film. And which methods did they use? Military methods. Very, very physical, almost brutal methods. Treat us civil! Yes. You gotta treat us nice, like. Uh, I'll try. What has happened in the last 20, 25 years is just a wonderful reversal. That's right. Wolf must avoid biting us sheep at all costs. All right. And now we're using lures and rewards, um, which makes virtually any animal trainable. What is that? Get out of here. Before Babe, Carl Lewis Miller was the ferocious dog man. Good, what a tough dog. He enjoys putting Woody through his paces. Woody, sit. Head down. Good boy, sir. Stay. Head up. Clearly, Woody is a versatile performer. Say hi to everyone. Oh, good boy. Sit. Oh, what a dog you are, Chris. Yeah. I haven't seen you for about a year and a half, huh? Had a boy. Filming Pig in the city in Australia has kept Carl from his own favorite dog. Chris is now Beethoven. Good boy. I feel that the dog is the only animal with the god given gift, the craving to be with man. Stay, stay. Uh, we human beings just seem to be drawn to the dog. We do have the feeling that a uh, dog is man's best friend. And that through a whole series of motion pictures with Rin Tin Tin and Lassie, there were so many 
films made, particularly during the 20s, 30s, 40s. Lassie's owner is Bob Weatherwax. His father, Rudd, trained the first dog whose real name was Pal. All right, Lassie, stay. We'll do this. Stay. Stay. All right, come on, come on. Here, come on, come on. Oh. All right, here, Lassie, come on. This is uh, the eighth generation Lassie. He's descended from the original Lassie. Turn your right. Turn your left. Right. In the last 50 years, my father's uh, bred 2,500 dogs because pal that my father did this with had this very exceptional markings. This the collie breeders consider a genetic imperfection. They don't want that. And they want just the straight masked out, no white. He has to have a full white collar, two front white legs. So we've spent years breeding to keep the look. It's trademark too, actually. It's, uh, it's a trademark. So it's different. But pretty. I think the blaze is very pretty. Lassie was so thrilled about being in Hollywood and being the star of this film that his tail would wag and it would blur in the photograph. So Rudd Weatherwax had to actually train a behavior so that when he cued Lassie, he would hold the tail perfectly still so the photographer could shoot the, the picture and get a great publicity still. But that had to be a trained behavior. Why is a dog man's best friend? Well, because a dog loves you in a very uncomplicated way. All human relationships are full of very complicated feelings, full of envy and competitiveness and things like that, no matter how good and loving they are. Um, dogs don't have that. One of the scenes in Lassie involves the actor being reunited with Lassie and in order to get Pal to give the wonderful warm welcome that we see on the screen, the actor had to have ice cream smeared on his face so that Lassie would leap up and actually be licking his face, giving him a kiss. Each time we worked with a pig, there was that one who, by being more sort of soulful, dare I say, by looking looking like a puppy dog and sort of, you know, I want food and so on. And there was the others who were more, a little more naughty and uh, the others uh, who were just a little bit more clever than the other. And, and those that simply uh, just had more charisma. And they often were the ones that would be on screen. If you remember that little tuft of dark hair that was on Babe's forehead, you're not going to believe it, it was a toupee. So the makeup artist had to glue little toupees on the six pigs that were being used each day on the set. Also, pigs have very light eyelashes. So in order to bring out the beauty of their eyes, the makeup artist had to color their eyes, the equivalent of a Greta Garbo, perhaps, mascara on the eyes so the eyelashes were dyed so that the eyes would show up beautifully on screen two scenes in the movie were accidents one was the pig coming out of the rooster house and falling off the plank that was a mistake and at the end of the shoot they decided the clumsy one was funnier and it got the biggest laugh in the picture next to one other scene that was unscripted. La, 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 la. The actress who did the voice la, of Babe la, saw the footage la, and said, oh my, it almost looks as if Babe is singing. And as they studied the footage, they said, yes, we can see that Babe seems to be singing, but I wonder what it could be he's singing. And that's where the la, 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 la came from. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. Part of the power of animal films is that you can transcend temporarily the sense of alienation, solitariness and aloneness. 
the sense of being totally different from someone else, which can be extremely painful. Prior to that, we have a sense of being at one with mother, of being the same with mother, um, and we want to reproduce it, have it all again. This oceanic feeling that Freud described. Fly. May I call you mom? So it's extremely therapeutic in a short period of time. It's for the uh, child in the adult and the adult in the child. So when, when, it, when an adult goes to the cinema to watch the film, he, can, he or she can again experience what it is to be a child, that, that enchantment that you might have had as a child. Flipper. The original feature film spawned two more movies and several television series. It all began here in Miami. A man by the name of Rico Browning uh, was watching Lassie and thought, well, if a collie dog could be made into a star animal, why not a dolphin? Training dolphins was all secret. It's like the falcon training. Nobody tells you how to do anything. Anyway, through hit and miss, I spent the next six months with my son, who was nine years old at the time, training Flipper. One of the hardest tricks was to teach Flipper to ride a boy, to say, hey, I want to give you a ride. And I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I told Ricky to stand on the end of the dock and I threw the ball, but it didn't hit the water. I threw it across the lake out of sight. And then Ricky jumped in and made a splash and the dolphin thought that's what I threw in the water. Flipper, come here. Flipper, so come Mitzi here. swam over to Ricky. She grabbed the belt loop, trying to bring him to me. And he just stuck his arm up and her fin just naturally fit into it and she towed him to it. The Flipper television series and movies brought to the American public a knowledge about the dolphin that the public had never had before. But too many dolphins have been captured and kept in huge aquariums at various places around the United States. And the dolphin in captivity is like a human being in prison. I don't think, even today, that they've scratched the surface as far as the dolphin's intelligence as to what they can do and not do. Probably at some point in the future, we're going to find the key to communication between man and the dolphin. And um, we're going to discover that we have a tremendously intelligent creature there in the water. Uh, whose intelligence may rival our own in some ways. It does look stupid, Mom. Not as stupid as sheep, mind you, but pigs are definitely stupid. I don't know how to place the pig's intelligence. No, we're not. But we accomplish more with the pigs in 10 weeks' time than we do with the dog in several years' time. Scientifically, in the past couple of years or so, all sorts of amazing things have been happening in the exploration of pig intelligence. Professor Thingamitite at, what should we call it, University in America, um, got these two pigs and he wanted them to work a joystick. That's okay, you're doing good. Which then flashed up um, replies of some sort on, on a screen. And of course, not having an opposed finger and thumb like us, the only thing they could work these things with was the snugs. 
Oh, good boy. That Professor was... Stanley Curtis of Pennsylvania State University thinks he's discovered that pigs are even more intelligent than chimpanzees, whose DNA is the closest to humans. Good job. Yeah. I would like to be able to have a conversation with a pig. That really is the, the goal. That's the objective, is to be able to get into their head and uh, figure out what they're thinking, how they're feeling, those sorts of things. We are just in our infancy in starting to explore this frontier. And one of the most recent examples is a story of some bonobo apes who were being taught sign language. And um, uh, there were a group of them. And, and one day, the group of them broke into a fight. And of course, the researchers are sitting there going, oh, what's going on? And one of the apes broke free and came over and explained to the researchers what the fight was about. Now, that's communication. It's uh, kind of a baldy, pinky, whitey thingy. Show him in. Oh, I'd like the bag back, please. Hey, pinkness. It's not until you actually experience these animals right there and you see how quite extraordinary they are. They're not to be dismissed as cute animals. Comes in with the bag, just doing its job, collecting stuff, and you barge in here, accusing and making demandments. They are complex. They do interact and relate to the world to the extent that the chimps could recognize in the storyboards their own drawings. How things work around here. What have we here? Tarzan, who would play Bob, we're in a negotiation. Would point to his drawing as opposed to Easy or, or Zooty, the other two characters. And uh, and that was again nothing that it was trained to do. It was something he did sort of spontaneously. Come on, wave, 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 wave. Good, good. Point, point, point. Think, think. Yeah, think, 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 think. Good. Steve Martin, um, not the actor was the primate trainer on Babe, Pig in the City. Look here. Look here. Here in Southern California, he has over a hundred wild animals being prepared for film work, most of them born in captivity. You know, when we go on a set, there's, there maybe is a hundred, hundred and fifty people on a set where if you take a, a thousand pound Kodiak bear on a set and you're going to work it around that many people, you have to have a very stable animal, which means a tremendous amount of time that you spent uh, getting that animal used to things and creating a very positive atmosphere for that animal. Diamond is a six-year-old, so he's not fully grown yet. He'll mature at about seven to eight years old, so he'll probably put on about another 200 pounds of weight and get a few inches taller. It's very important to raise our animals from babies. We need to know what they're exposed to uh, all through their life. So when we take them into new environments, uh, we're going to know how they're going to react. It's easy to read them once you learn about bears and they telegraph everything through body language, the same as humans do. It's just that humans uh, are relying more on verbal communication now than they have in the past. So we're losing our, our touch to be able to read body language. That's a good bear. That's probably one of the reasons why animal trainers don't get along with as many people because we read their body language, not just what they're saying to us. So, <laughs> yeah, a animals are honest all the time anyway, so they don't always say one thing and their body says something else. Okay. Marshmallow is just kind of like the bears have sweet tooth, so he likes it every now and then, and uh, that's his reward, his paycheck. This is Leo, he's about an 18 month or 16 month old, actually male African lion. The vast majority of the time that he spends is, uh, is with us rather than with his brother. Being as lions are social, if he spent a lot of time with his brother, he'd like his brother a lot more than he likes us. But we've still got three or four years of work to do with this lion before he's ready to do a lot of film work. So it's a, a very, very long process of training him for doing film. It's better to have people that they're secure and sure with that will greet them properly. Like that there, you can see that he goes up and he throws his head and his shoulder into Jamie. And you've got to stand in real nice and firm and give them a good solid rub. If you are hesitant and pull back at all or touch them too softly, they think something's wrong with you and 
they wonder why you're not giving them the, the, the pride greeting like they're supposed to have. What do you so. <laughs> <laughs> you want to play with your ball? No, I don't think so. The film Born Free was made from Joy Adamson's book, Born Free. And the story is about the rehabilitation of Elsa as she grew up and became a mature lamas back to the wild, which was a painful and difficult task, but eventually successful. It's too late to try to let her go wild now. All we're doing is making her miserable, torturing her. How can you be so cruel? What's wrong with the zoo anyway? Nothing, except that she won't be free. And is freedom so important? Yes. She was born free and she has the right to live free. I think that born free started a train of thought. It got people to say, what should the relationship be between animals and people? And if it should be, as we believe, based on mutual respect, and animals living in their natural environment, then using animals in films seems to undermine that in many respects. You have to use in feature films with the pressure of finance and the pressure of time and everything else, you have to use trained animals, animals that have been persuaded in one form or another to, to perform certain actions and, and tricks and maneuvers. Those animals are not part of their own social society, they're not part of an ecosystem, they're not living a natural life. The lambs and lamases that were used in the film were untrained. But at some period, they'd known human beings, and so they were used to people around. got a sense of what it was to be in the wild for an animal and so then when we saw how so many animals are kept in captivity we realized there was an enormous void between the two and the, the captive side of the void provided often intolerable lives for these magnificent and special and wonderful creatures not just lions but all sorts of other animals and so I think we should seriously try and eliminate performing animals from films. We should be looking at these animals as intelligent beings and not some toy actor or little performing robot and be trying to understand what they really are, and what their society is all about. Pat Darby was a Hollywood animal trainer. She became disillusioned with the way most of the animals were treated. She now runs a sanctuary for abused and rejected victims of the entertainment world. All of the animals that are here could never have a hope of living in the wild. Lenny worked in Hollywood movies, lots of Disney films and other feature films. And then when he was no longer useful, he'd been declawed, defanged, he was given to a traveling animal show. What does a person learn from seeing an animal in a movie where their mouth moves and they talk? When there's a whole world that we're deprived of even understanding. I think that the only true relationship for the future is going to be one based upon us as being respectful observers of animals in their natural habitat. And if there is a future uh, for animals and film, I think it has to be one that is based on the integrity of wildlife documentaries. 
When it comes to mating, each male is for himself. This time, Hook wins, and for the period Bounce remains receptive, he'll follow hot on her heels. I think we've suffered from something that I've called David Attenborough theology. The typical wildlife documentary homes in on a particular view of animal behaviour related to things like sex and hunger and killing. Animals don't just have sex and eat. Uh, there's a range uh, of uh, emotional life and mental life that isn't captured on wildlife film. They are emotional, mental creatures that have a range of life. And it's that that we need to focus on. Free Willy is a film about the release of a whale dying in captivity. Keiko, who plays the whale, had an equally miserable life. He'd been imprisoned in a small, shallow pool in Mexico. I think what's interesting about some of the very best feature films on animals is that they help reconnect us with the animal world. They make the invisible visible. They give us a sense of being part not just of a nation or of community, a local community, but of a world community, that we are creatures together in the same universe. In many ways, they exhibit a kind of world of lost innocence, where we can have creative relationships of joy with other living creatures. Such was the public reaction to Free Willy that over $11 million was raised to rehabilitate Keiko and prepare him for freedom. This news footage from October 1998 shows the latest stage of Keiko's release. He's just been shipped to Icelandic waters. The reason that Iceland was chosen as the relocation site is that's where Keiko was originally captured from. And the studies that have been done on the language of orca show that even after many, many, many years in captivity, an orca caught from the wild can remember the language of its original founder population and possibly even the language of its family. I think what's interesting about some of the very best feature films on animals is that they're part of what I would call the re of animals. Animals have often not been thought of as beings with souls of any kind, but basically machines, commodities, things. And what feature films have done is by um, exploring the complexity of our emotional relationship with them has shown that they are more than lumps of meat. Pigs believe that the sooner they grew large and fat, the sooner they'd be taken into pig paradise. A place so wonderful that no pig had ever thought to come back. There's just no good biblical reason for denying souls or spirit to animals. The biblical view is that we are indeed going to find animals in heaven. Why? Animals have an afterlife. They have a relationship with God as we do ourselves that persists beyond death. And what, for example, a film like Babe has enabled us to do is to see the world from a pig's point of view. No small achievement. The fact is that animals that don't seem to have a purpose really do have a purpose. The bosses have to eat. It's probably the most noble purpose of all when you come to think about it. They eat pigs? Pork, they call it. Or bacon. They only call them pigs when they're alive. Two pigs are on the run in Wiltshire after escaping from an abattoir in Malmesbury. They managed to squeeze through a hole in the fence and swim to freedom across the River Avon. Didn't know pigs could swim, to be honest. 
to see that, I thought, well, fair play to him, you know. Any animal that escapes from an abattoir, I wish it the best of luck. I think they should be able to live the rest of their lives free. Everyone has made them into two celebrities. This is a worldwide event, isn't it? Absolutely. I think Babe heightened porcine perception and there became a sort of groundswell of pro-pig feeding. So that in America, I'm told, though I think it's probably apocryphal, um, pork eating slumped completely and the children walked about bearing placards saying, Don't eat, babe! From the International Ballroom of the Beverly Hilton Hotel, the Ark Trust presents the 10th Annual Genesis Awards. Ten years ago, ex-Broadway actress Gretchen Weiler set up the Genesis Awards to celebrate productions which have helped increase animal awareness. Thank you very much. It has been an amazing 10 years, and I'm really very, very proud to be standing here. I founded the Ark Trust because I have uh, had the very strong belief that it is much more important to change minds than laws, because laws can be passed and not enforced, minds. And how do you do that? Through the major media. We are enormously pleased to present the Genesis Award for Outstanding Feature Film to Babe. So I wanted to have an organization that rewarded the media for having raised consciousness on issues of animal abuse and exploitation. And the feature film, more than any other media, can do more to change things. Well, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the 900 animals without whose participation this film would not have uh, happened. This consciousness didn't even exist in the late 60s when I got involved. I cannot tell you how remarkable this, just a nanosecond of time, how things have changed. Uh, and now I'd, I'd like, if you'd indulge me, to bring out a new little friend of mine, a sort of a celebrity lookalike. In the days when I started, 30 years ago, people didn't question where the food came from, the fur, the rodeo animals, the zoo animals, whatever, wherever it was, the animals were being utilized for our entertainment, food or fashion, no one questioned. Today, at least, the question is being raised, and that's all I can ask for. I think in the next 30 years, there'll be a remarkable, even more change, where we will just coexist peaceably with nature. If I consulted with quadrupeds, think what fun we'd have, asking over crocodiles for tea or maybe lunch with two or three lions, walruses, or sea lions. What a lovely place the world would be. <laughs> if I could parley with pachyderm, it's a fairy tale worthy of Hans Anderson or Grimm. A man who walks with the animals, talks with the animals, grunts and squeaks and squawks with the animals. How oh, easy, they? just think of it. And they could talk to me. What a dog. What a dog.